Your commentator is Ed Hurley. The 30th of December, 1940, saw the high tide of Nazi bombing raids, and London flamed with a thousand fires raging at one time. This great fire blitz destroyed much of old historic London. How safe is our country from such raids? From bases in Western Europe, German long-range bombers could fly to our east coast and return. They have planes that can carry thousands of incendiaries all the way to our cities in the Middle West. And there's always the possibility of an enemy aircraft carrier stealing within bombing range of our west coast. Japanese planes are known to have scouted this area. Without doubt, they were carrier-based planes. Almost every section along the entire Pacific coast is within range of enemy planes that can carry thousands of incendiary bombs. Firefighting organizations, the regulars or volunteers, do not have sufficient men to fight either a large-scale incendiary attack or even an organized campaign of arson. Defense councils throughout the nation have called for men of endurance and courage to volunteer as auxiliary firemen. All over America, thousands of men have responded. Thousands more are needed to enroll at defense headquarters or at the neighborhood firehouses. Trained volunteer firemen in the smaller communities instruct auxiliary firemen in groups, acquainting them with standard apparatus and firefighting equipment, and directing courses of study in first aid, war gases, and departmental regulations. Auxiliaries are given training in groups for teamwork in the use of equipment. The experienced firemen must develop them into aids of real value. Intensive training is required to become an efficient fireman. In almost any large city, rookies have to attend a fire department school before they are assigned to regular duty. Men identified by number so that instructions to individuals can be given are learning here that the hose is carried under the left shoulder and over the right. This is a safety first measure in the use of the 35-foot ladder. The proper method of hoisting a hose is taught with a half hitch and clove hitch safely securing it until it reaches men on the roof. The use of the scaling ladder is taught, and rookies quickly become adept in climbing up the side of a building from window to window, frequently the only way in which firemen can reach upper floors, both for firefighting and for rescue work. Teamwork is always stressed, especially in these vitally important first jobs at every fire, when seconds count and the least loss of time may mean a more difficult job ahead. These firemen are learning to use one of the many types of hydrants installed throughout every city, connecting it to the apparatus representing the pumper. They then connect the hose line to the outlet valve, quickly and accurately catching the threads of the coupling. Beginners are taught that different types of fire require different fire streams, the solid stream to carry to the base of a fire, and the spray stream to divide water particles as finely as possible in order to obtain heat absorption. Weeks of training are necessary to become an acceptable fireman, and this will suffice to show that the citizen volunteering for duty as an auxiliary fireman needs to give a minimum of two hours weekly over a long period to adequately learn the fundamentals of firefighting.
This is a typical fire bomb, weighing about two pounds. A bomb of this type can penetrate the roof of the average small home and burn violently, throwing off molten steel particles which spread the fire. It is the duty of civilians to act quickly and prevent the fire bomb from accomplishing its deadly work because it may not be possible to obtain any of the firefighting services to extinguish the flames. The Office of Civilian Defense has approved an effective method of fighting the fire bomb, and if this method is used without loss of time, the services of firemen are far less likely to be needed. Using the jet or solid stream of water from a stirrup pump, the civilian firefighter knocks the bomb apart, taking cover as he does this. Note that the molten particles of steel are scattered away from him due to the force of the jet. He then follows in and quenches the remains of the bomb at any small fires that may start. The factory that has been hit can be saved by the firemen if proper measures have been taken. Here auxiliary firefighters are on the job and a pump tank is seen in action. This tank, which can be refilled while in operation, holds about four gallons of water, enough for at least two bombs. This and other devices demonstrated in these scenes all use water for dealing with fire bombs and the fires they cause. Extinguishers of this type can also be effectively used. It is one that is commonly seen in factories, hotels, and restaurants, and it produces a foam. But there are also the soda acid and gas cartridge types. They are all operated in the same way. So long as water pressure is available, the garden hose is an excellent weapon. But none of this equipment is likely to be effective if the citizen fails to clean out the trash that litters up the average attic. When a fire bomb goes to work in a place such as this, the danger of the fire quickly getting beyond control is very great. The best part of the job of fighting fire bombs is done before they fall. Believe it or not, it is actually very difficult for a fire bomb to start fires in an attic like this. In this war, no place on earth is safe from air attack. One bomber may carry as many as 2,000 fire bombs, and these are responsible for the destruction sweeping through great areas of London in this fire blitz. There is ample proof that much of this destruction can be prevented if every person will learn how to fight fire bombs and stand ready to deal with them when they fall. This is an air raid on London that occurred only four months after the fire blitz of December 1940. But in spite of the fact that many more incendiary bombs were dropped, far less damage resulted because auxiliary civilian firefighters were on the job.